Hi, good evening. Thank you all for being here. It's so wonderful. And a bit of um, a weather culture shock to be here from LA where it was 80 yesterday. And I had a total panic attack about undergarments on Friday and went to Uniqlo and was like, I need turtlenecks. And they were like, um, yeah, we don't, ha we don't have those. <laughs> like it was this moment of like, I don't know, climate dysphoria. Um, I can ramble about all sorts of stuff while my name is on the screen. It's really great. So I, um, I work for her. Um, she is an amazing boss. She has created um, a very interesting life for me. No, in all seriousness, um, I am a painter and uh, studied painting uh, at Swarthmore College, which is outside of, it's funny because in California, nobody knows what I'm talking about, but I realize I'm on the East Coast, so you all know where Philadelphia is. Um, outside of Philadelphia, Swarthmore was a Quaker school, um, a liberal arts college that really um, cemented my interest uh, in a way that I think is very different from a lot of my peers who are abstract painters, in that when I was in graduate school at the California College for the Arts, I asked myself one question, which was, well, I asked myself a lot of questions, but the main important one that I remember asking myself is, what will interest me over the long term? And what will interest me when no one is there and when everyone is there? I had this feeling um, that that would be an important series of questions to have an answer for. Um, I saw the art world then, as is now, that people were going after you know, single opportunities, but not really thinking through longevity, like what will interest me over my life. And the, the thing that I knew about myself at age, in my 20s, um, was that I loved to read and I was passionate about reading. And I moved to LA in part because Los Angeles has an incredible uh, scene of language and text-based art, um, from Barbara Kruger to Ed Ruscha to um, John Baldessari, I wanted to be part of a community that had this really very rigorous conceptual language, uh, sort of 2 and 3D uh, history. So I'm going to share with you some of the paintings that I've just been working on secretly for the last four years, which is kind of a crazy thing to do, is to make work um, without showing it. But apparently this is what I decided because I made a massive stylistic change. Um, and, and so I'm really, really thrilled to be able to show these in June at, at Lowell Ryan Projects. And what these are, are large works on paper. Um, here's a detail so you can see the, the text is a rubbing. Um, and it's a mirror image text. Um, I've been very interested in cognition, how we perceive language. Um, so most of my work has had the language either doubled or backwards to sort of move you away from a literal reading of the text um, into trying to make sense of it as though you were um, a visitor to a country where you didn't speak the language. So to try to make it a little bit of a foreign entity, um, you know, when you really have to go to the bathroom and you're in a country where you don't speak the language, you make sense of bathroom in all sorts of other ways, um, you know, through, through doors and colors and other kinds of symbols. So this text says, I was born to love, not to hate. And it's a quote from Sophocles' Antigone. So that myth, if you don't remember, no happy endings in it. It's a young Antigone teenage girl standing up to her uncle Creon, who has taken over the kingship of, and I can't say this word in English without laughing, because I think you say it, Thebes. Teb sounds so sexy in French, so we're going to stick with that. The king of Teb. And um, he has, uh, her brothers have fought each other over the ruling Teb and um, have killed each other. And one brought in sort of uh, forces from outside the kingdom, so he's considered a traitor and his body lays rotting. And King Creon says that he cannot be buried. Antigone declares that there is a higher rule of law sort of God's law or natural law and, and dares, goes out and buries symbolically her brother and is sentenced to death. It's, uh, it's great because then her fiance commits suicide and there's no one left in the play. But it's an incredible myth, um, Antigone, because it has been important to every generation uh, because of the transcendent views of grace, of love, overcoming an oppositional politics. Uh, I just went on not this last Friday, the one before, to hear Carrie Mae Weems' version of Antigone, which was a collaborative um, cohort of dance and music and images um, speaking to the African-American experience of, of police 
uh, murdering so many people uh, in, in our communities nationwide. And it was very powerful. What was interesting to me, because I had just written the press release for my show, is that there were phrases that she used to describe Antigone that I had also written, like literal phrases, which is the rule of law coming into conflict with this higher law and Antigone taking the position that love or grace is a higher position. Um, and it's actually not against anything, but it's a witnessing position. So these paintings are for me a mashup of abstraction. You know, you could jokingly say you see some Frank Stella and some Helen Frankenthaler. Um, so I'm quoting abstraction, but I'm inserting text into this other position, uh, which I, I'm going to call the antigonal position, but it's rubbing um, large uh, pores of paint that are almost like chemical photography and that I let them dry, revealing the image over time. Um, the stripes, you know, meant to symbolize the rule of law. Uh, and they're beautiful. I love pink. I mean, you know, what can I say? There's, there's got to be a little bit of that, like, actual passion for the materiality and composition. So I hate to have blazed through my entire painting career, but that's what I'm going to show you really about my painting. Because I think it's important for me at least to talk about the artist in the world. Like, I don't assume that every artist is going to think like me, but I think it's important for me to speak to how I see myself as an artist in the world. Um, I was an only child growing up. So I love spending time alone, and I love the studio, but I also come up with all sorts of crazy ideas. Um, and one of them was spurred on um, by fandom. So I'm a huge fan. I really believe in the fan position, the loving, the amateur position in the French sense of I love others. Um, and I don't seek to replace them. I seek to really just appreciate them. And one of the writers who turned my life inside out and upside down as a young person was the French philosopher and playwright Hélène Sixou, and that's C-I-X-O-U-S. And she uh, came from the same cohort as Jacques Derrida, um, you know, northern uh, Algerian, uh, sort of without a country, Jewish, Sephardic uh, founder of the first women's studies program in all of Europe. Uh, put in charge of a little university where Deleuze, Guattari, and Foucault were the guys in her faculty, a, a real powerhouse who believes in uh, writing theater and literature, as well, literary texts as well as, as philosophic texts. And so she gave me, we became friends through my fandom in this weird way. I got to meet her and uh, we started this sort of mentorship. And when Jacques Derrida died, she gave me a book um, that she had written about telepathy. And Derrida was obsessed with Freud's secret texts on telepathy. Freud believed in it. But his followers thought that telepathy seemed to be uh, not scientific enough for this new thing called uh, psychology. Um, and so repressed them. So Jacques was doing research on them. And Hélène was obsessed with Jacques's obsession. And so I was given this text about telepathy. Now Freud, Derrida, Sixou Grant. One kid does not belong there, or at least felt like she didn't belong there. So, so what did I do? I invited the French public and the LA public to come and draw this text with me. Because her whole definition of telepathy was that it was one step further than empathy. So if empathy, if sympathy is, I can see, I just see you in yoga, it's so great. <laughs> I can see you're having a moment. Uh, sympathy is that I see you're having the moment. Empathy is I've had a moment similar to that. And telepathy, one step further, would be that my experience of seeing you wouldn't be privileged, that my I wouldn't be defined against your thou, that they would be parallel. So I love this idea of creating a space where we are truly equals, where the other and the I aren't defined in an oppositional way. This is a long preamble to explain what ghost town is and why I'm showing you this eyeball for a really long time. <laughs> so I developed this methodology. It's really, really clever, scientific, with post-it notes, where I would put the text at the top of this giant drawing and the key words circled in the text on post-it notes all over this drawing, and I invited the public to come and draw First Helen's text, and then this is in Guatemala in 2016, 
to come and draw this poetry with me um, and to have it be a project of hospitality so that every person who enters, whether they're a gardener or a shoe cobbler or an heiress, um, are on the exact same plane in terms of their participation, where every participant is named alphabetically. I'm in the G's. Um, and so I did this project, like I said, with Helen Sixu's text and then was invited to do the Guatemala Guatemala Biennial and worked with a poet named Vanya Vargas. And this was an incredible experience for me because it really opened up uh, my sense of, of what my studio could be, like how I could invite and welcome and make people feel safe, um, other artists and non-artists to participate equally. And what was so incredible, um, and you can see the quality of the work here, I worked with 600 people in 10 days and the average return time was five times like people came five times so of the 600 people the participations were we 3,000 participations which meant that on average I was drawing with between 50 and 100 people at all times it was really unbelievably amazing and what was interesting is that the, the, the words, because they were Guatemalan words in the sense of Vanya Vargas was writing about genocide, she was writing about civil war, she was writing about the ghosts in Guatemala City, that this triggered these wonderful unconscious drawing moments. And um, in the United States, when I did the collaborative drawing, m people suffered from, I'm a genius, like <laughs> everyone doing something over other people, large, no problem touching or messing with someone else's drawing. In France, people, like one in four people would participate. People wanted to come and be voyeurs. Um, in Guatemala, nobody wanted to touch anyone else's. So you had tons of like super cute little things, but this idea of like actual collaboration like there was a real sense of equality, but not of how to join things up. And so that became the biggest challenge. And again, the way I could do that, and this is the drawing ended up being 120 feet. So it's a very long space, hard to document, but was to integrate and get people to, um, to draw together. And I, the only way I could do it was by modeling the behavior. So I had to be there. Um, it was interesting when I did the project in LA, Urs Fisher had a show where he invited the LA public to come and make clay with him at MoCA. It's the exact same time and he was flew in his chef and his pianist and the title said, you know, whatever blobs of clay, that was the name of the show. I obviously love this project. <laughs> um, but it said Urs Fisher and a thousand Angelinos. And my project, I was listed, like I said, under G, right? And so it's a very different space spirit when you name, when you include, when you give ownership to collaborative projects. So that was like, you know, again, I share this project because I've now done four of them. Um, and it's a methodology that I'm happy to share with anyone if you're ever interested in doing a project. I train uh, people to work with local poets. Um, all, I've trained people all over Guatemala to do murals in this method because it's really an interesting thing when you get people to work together who wouldn't normally work together. So that's a project that expands my studio, um, but still is in the painting, in, in, still is in the genre of painting. Um, this painting actually it's in a museum in in, um, in Guatemala now, and it's they can't take it down because it's actually a record from 2016 of. I would say 80% of the members of the Guatemala art world. And so someone uh, died right after we did it. And, and I think it's people realize that it's gonna be a memorial, like a, a trace, I wouldn't say a snapshot, or, you know, but this real record of, of so many styles in a cultural moment. So I was really, again, pleased to be able to sort of figure out how to be the host. Oh, and I should say that I grew up in Mexico City. so. I am and still, you know, will always be taller than most people, but, but at least the language barrier wasn't there. Um, another project that you mentioned, thank you for that lovely introduction, by the way, and thank you all for being here and thanks to this amazing place. It's a really special place. I've only been here 24 hours, but I already feel it. Um, I, I think because of the Quaker background from Swarthmore, but also my parents were both educators, I became, I've become really interested in, and philanthropy, and so the love of other people. How do we as artists um, not just participate economically where we're always looking to receive, but we also create economic opportunities for others? I mean, I don't know about the East Coast, but on the West Coast, the numbers are dire. 
I was interviewed for five months by a gallery that had one woman and she was 80. And I finally had to give myself a little like, they're never going to take you on moment. Like the numbers are 30% female. And I'm not even going to address other kinds of difference. Uh, museum shows, solo shows, I think is 24% at MOCA. I think it's 27% at LACMA. It's dire. I teach 60% of my students are women, right? What happens to women? What happens? And so um, I think as a woman, I used to use this really dirty word when I taught entrepreneur. Ooh, I got in a lot of trouble back in the day. Now, thank God for the younger people who you have to be an entrepreneur to survive. But, but I really believe that we have to create, we can't replace the generosity of donors or artists foundations, but we can do little things and a little money goes a long way. So I began this project called the Grant Love Project it started out, this is what my old work used to look like. So yeah, I'm about to go through like a major public, like I picked up a ruler, guys. <laughs> oh, <laughs> everything that I learned, I learned in kindergarten. That is a chestnut and it's true in, this, in my case. Anyway, this was a work I did in 20, 2008. And it's a representation of the sense of sight, a collaboration with a hypertext poet named Michael Joyce, who teaches at Vassar College, a wonderful writer. And um, there is a line from the painting, which is a really a Beatles line, that's a love that should have lasted. I think I listened to a lot of Beatles while making that painting, um, a sculpture that I made. But there was something about this photo and that love symbol that really, really just, I don't know, you know, caught my attention and I realized had a lot of value. In the same way, this has a lot of value. Um, I don't know, this is something I learned in art history, which was that Robert Indiana never protected his legal rights to this symbol. So he is never, you buy a mug with this on it, maybe he, there's now a licensing with his estate, but no money that was made from selling this image went to anything he ever controlled because he never trademarked it or copyrighted it. So I, knowing very little about the law, trademarked my symbol. Um, and then got into litigation with a corporation that's very philanthropic in the arts for two years. It really, really, really <coughs> redefined what being a word artist was for me. When you're sitting being deposed with some, you know, highly paid lawyer who's like, well, what gives you the right to own love? And I'm like, well, I'm an artist. What gives a corporation the right to own love? Because you can spend a million dollars fighting an artist. So. I'm able, I still have my copyright. Um, I fought for it because I began to realize that we live in a really crazy time where corporations own words like love. Think about it. You know, it's incidents like that that changed my career. You know, I think the biggest piece of advice of, forgive me, but I'm blonde so I can give advice. Um, <clears throat> that was funny to me. Uh, <laughs> Oh, you're just lucky I didn't have a glass of wine before this. Um, <laughs> that, that, that there are things that are only going to happen to you, right? Now just think about that. We think of ourselves as artists, as creatives. We're like outside, thinking outside the box, but we often want what other artists have. And in fact, the things that make an artist's career are the things that only happen to you and only you have the power to recognize. So for me, you know, being in litigation with this um, luxury brand taught me that I had something I didn't know was valuable, right? And so I've run with it. I think if I hadn't been in litigation, I wouldn't have valued it as much. So my first project, which 10 years later we're about to complete and it does not look like this, is called The Love House. And The Love House is a, a family house across the street from the Watts Towers. This is 10 years ago. You can notice that I was not blonde at that point in time. And uh, that is Monique. These are our architects. Um, and we decided to create a public, private, nonprofit, artist, sort of awesome mom, single mom raising kids in Watts collaboration that would rethink her property and its position across the street from the Watts Towers. And we did this by selling really, really tiny little sculptures, other little tiny sculptures. So again, thinking about fundraising or having projects happen, um, in solidarity with the people who want them to happen, not because there is a political agenda from a foundation. Um, and so I realized that what I have done in the Love Project, or what I hope to do, and I hope this goes on after my death, I'm sorry, I'm not morbid, but I am, 
I do have an attorney who nags at me about these things, is um, to think about this idea of art as currency, right? And also more than that, because it's not just a materialistic or capitalist uh, strategy, it really is about alchemy. And it's not just about friend raising, it's about fun, not about fundraising, it's about friend raising. So I did this project with beach towels and the artist is Devin Suno, an LA based artist. He, here we are being super cute with our beach towel. Um, we sold and donated maybe yeah, $10,000 from the sale of these towels, but at the party we threw for the towels, a friend came who met the director who donated a quarter of a million dollars to the heart of Los Angeles. And I live in a very dangerous neighborhood in Los Angeles called MacArthur Park, where 60% of the kids don't get to high school, but 100% of the kids who go to OLA graduate high school and go on to college, 100%. And so I love to think about what is the role that arts education can play and how really it's a civil rights issue when you're not teaching people who come from the lowest quintile economically, many of them young girls, how to rotate complex 3D, 4D items in their heads, um, that you're really doing a disservice to our future leaders and you're really discriminating against race and class lines. So I love to support OLA. It's one of the many organizations we support them, not only the kids, but the teaching artists. Many of you have graduated from school, remember this experience that you're unhirable, right? Like, what do I do to make a living? Well, it's, it's giving money to an organization like OLA that has artists who are teachers as well as helping the kids. And I just, sorry, they're so cute. Um, another, uh, I just did this uh, extra as a contemporary art journal, Los Angeles. We only have three magazines and it's, um, you know, it's one of those things. We have to work hard to support public discourse. So I did um, a love print that supported them. Another organization that I love um, is called Project Angel Food. Um, they, it's an arts auction, but they support people who can no longer feed themselves, who are terminally ill. And I can't express and forgive this. You'll please don't walk away thinking I'm a narcissist, but. It, um, I just wanted, it's the only picture of the work I could find. I sold three of these at an auction in two minutes and raised $60,000. And they sent me a letter telling me how many meals it was and I wept, right? So oftentimes as artists, we don't have a real measure as to whether we're making a difference. And for me personally, the Love Project has helped me um, participate in the world in a way that makes me feel good. I'm sorry, I do believe in happiness, you guys. <laughs> but then there's the dark side, of course. <laughs> the inner goth shadows. So, um, I, yeah, yeah, how can I describe shadows? I had one rule in grad school that I would never illustrate, ever illustrate. My work would always be text, and it would be, you know, both representational and, I mean, it was so intellectual. It was like, oh God, Professor Grant. Um, and so I, I got this text uh, in 2010, it was called Ode to Happiness. It was written by the very famous writer Keanu Reeves. And I made him this book called Ode to Happiness, which made us both giggle. And uh, we published it with Seidel, the great German book publisher. So we returned to our collaboration in 2013, 2014, and I decided, no, that's not true, I did not decide. I was approached by a magazine to do a picture or do an image with Keanu where he would do a line of text. And I proposed, because I had no idea how to do this, to take pictures of Keanu's shadow for this magazine and that he would write poetry inspired by Malcolm Lowry's Under the Volcano. There's a line in that book where the gentleman protagonist says to the lady, I guess she's also a protagonist, um, actually she says to him, I don't have a home to offer you. This is a Mexican woman to a European, uh, but you can always come live in my shadow. And I just thought that was so beautiful. And so I sent that to Keanu and he wrote me within the first night, 85 poems. Anyway, the book, the magazine never <laughs> happened. Um, these photos surprising, were very surprising to both of us. We, we, I learned how to do InDesign because I thought, wouldn't it be great uh, to be able to design the book without anyone knowing that we were making this secret photography project. Um, and so w 
we made this this beautiful book and this beautiful work where the 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 shadow is the source of light and uh, you know I found through Photoshop because I don't really know uh, the rules of being a photographer so I allowed myself to make the photos pink if that's what the emotional uh, you know the emotion of the text and the image suggested but I learned how to color correct from Jurgen Teller at Steidl I mean it's incredible like the, the again back to that advice if something is happening to only you, maybe pursue it. And this was definitely a lightning bolt. But out of that interest in creating artist books and learning about you know, publishing through Steidl, Keanu and I founded in 2017 a small company called X Artist Books. That's what happens when I name things. Just really hard to say. Um, XAB is easier. And we published four books in the first year. The Artist Prison, which is a, a book where I wanted to have the experience of being the writer. So I wrote this, this project about the art world all being about this many people in a prison called the Artist Prison, but it's closing down and it's an imaginary future state, sort of Kafka-esque. And I had an artist illustrate it named Eve Wood very interesting to have done to me what I have done to so many writers. <laughs> I was like, wow, I didn't see that one coming, but it was incredible. Um, we published a book called High Winds. Sylvan Oswald is a trans male playwright who teaches at UCLA, collaborating with Jessica Fleischman, a graphic designer. Again, I'm not sure what this book is. Is it um, LGBTQ theater? Is it graphic design? I'm sorry, I don't have the images inside, but all of this stuff is online. Uh, we picked up our first institutional book, The Words of Others, Palabras Ajenas, um, for Pacific Standard Time, a book protesting uh, the Catholic Church's role in the Vietnam War, written by uh, an Argentine artist in exile in Brazil. Uh, very, very polemical. In fact, the current pope uh, censored a show of his work when he was a bishop. So it's very interesting like, to get into the politics of that. And Zeus, um, you can't tell anything about the contents other than those tiny little black blobs are political jurisdictions in the banlieue of Paris uh, that have the most awful poverty. Um, and Benoit Fougerel, the artist, went and photographed uh, the failure of modern architecture in these particular zones. And it's been, you know, what a pleasure for me to be able to work with each team on the books. Um, coming up, I'm working on uh, George Herms and Diane De Prima, uh, a, a book of their uh, a collaboration of haiku. Uh, Etel Adnan, who is uh, both a poet and a painter who lives in Paris from Palestinian background, and the filmmaker Lynn Marie Kirby. We're publishing the first monograph of a wonderful uh, woman uh, who passed away, I think, I don't, I'm not going to make up a number. <laughs> like, I should probably know that. We're going to delete that. We're going to edit that. Um, and so it's fun, again, to have, like, the, the press as a way, an extension of how to create uh, a discourse around certain kinds of practices. Um, there's only so many books I can publish, uh, you know, uh, on top of everything else I do. But I really, I really love that sense of, of planting a seed or of the first four books, three of them were performances. So that books can become exhibitions. That's what I learned from Shadows and I wanted to share with other artists through the press. Um, you know, that, that, that a book can be, because we often think, I mean, maybe you've had this thought, but you go into an exhibition and you think this should be a book. Maybe I'm the only person who thinks that, but I often think that a book would be a better record often of some shows um, and that out of the book, real life experiences can happen, not just the haptic experience of holding the book and an int you know, intimacy with self um, through reading, but, but what can happen when the book gets performed, when it gets um, reimagined and being in the world. So uh, I'm going to stop talking and open up. You may not have any questions or, and then you can stay in touch. Oh, that's, that's it, too bad. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But if you have any questions, I'm here all week too, and I'm doing studio visits with hopefully some of you. So you can save your question for later in the week, but if you want to 